We stand for the Gospel reading in reverence for those words revealed to us directly by the Father through the Messiah, especially so the words we hear today, which one might describe as the famous last words of Jesus the Messiah. It's taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter, beginning at the 16th verse, near the, near the very end of Jesus' sojourn on earth before he returned to the Father. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed to them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The Gospel of the Lord. Father in heaven, we confess to you that uh, we are indeed limited, that while we may be fearfully and wonderfully made, we know so little. And we pray that uh, as we approach these mysteries, we ask that uh, you would comfort us and assure us that we can trust in you, have confidence in your great love and care for us even when we don't understand why th things happen the way they do. We pray that uh, you'll give each one of us a gift of faith and indeed a gift to let mysteries be mysteries to let those secret things that belong to you stay with you. But we ask that you would give, indeed give us grace to enable us to do those things that are clear to us and those things that you've called upon us to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. The prayer was a feeble attempt in a way to um, encapsulate what is written in Deuteronomy 29, 29. Yes, the secret things belong to the Lord, but what the Lord has, but the Lord has indeed revealed some things to us and we're responsible for those things that he's revealed to us. And thus we come to Trinity Sunday. This is the only Sunday in the year in uh, which we celebrate or think about a theological idea. All the other Sundays, or all, our, the, all the other Christian festivals, Christian feasts, are all related or connected to a historical event. So uh, the birth of John the Baptist, the Annunciation, uh, the angel Gabriel to Mary, Easter, Good Friday, Christmas, so on and so forth. And if you're a preacher, there's always a challenge when you come to a holiday. Should you preach the text, yes, that are assigned for the holiday, or should you preach the holiday? And usually I'm a firm believer in preaching the text and somehow mentioning the holiday. That's a more important and a uh, more fruitful way to um, teach a community or to, to inform believers. But here I think we have a little bit of a challenge, and uh, the challenge uh, is perhaps twofold. First of all, we, uh, our congregation, our family, we are living in Jerusalem. And we're living with a, a large uh, Jewish community or large uh, number of Jewish communities along with large Muslims. And to talk about 
the triunity of the Godhead or the Trinity is uh, very difficult in the, in the environment in which we live. The Trinity is misunderstood and uh, as a result, we oftentimes misunderstand it ourselves. I think the second thing, it really concerns uh, the history of our church and the history of uh, the community here that was uh, planted uh, first by the London Jew Society back in the 1820s or the 1830s. And that is, is that this community has always had an appreciation for the Jewish context of the gospel. We've always had an appreciation for Jewish roots. Now at the beginning, uh, it uh, wasn't uh, perhaps the most refined or the most sophisticated, but certainly over uh, the years, over the decades, we have understood that the best, underst the best way to understand Jesus and the best way to be his disciples is to understand Jesus and discipleship in that Jewish context. And uh, many of you may know that we have promoted the work of Marvin Wilson over the years who wrote Our Father Abraham, Dwight Pryor, who was certainly a uh, good friend of ours. And with Jewish roots, not only well, not only comes blessing and renewal and refreshment and clarity, perhaps, but also comes some confusion. And one of the areas, one of the places where the confusion is happening or can, has uh, happened in the past is very simply, how can we say the gospel is Jewish and then claim that Jesus is divine. Don't Jews reject that? How can we say that the gospel is Jewish and that there's a triunity in the Godhead? And many of my friends today, many, some who are believers, some who are not, have a very difficult time with this. And there's a certain, even those who people consider themselves orthodox, there's a certain compartmentalization that somehow the God of Israel and the God of the Old Testament is in this little block over here. And uh, we and who are believers or, uh, in Jesus or who read the New Testament, we sort of have a different God. He's the, God, he's the, the, uh, it's, it's the Trinity, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there is this disconnect, and somehow we don't know how to put them together. And we live in a certain tension. And here I'd just like to address a few things. I think it's really important because we have many people who are listening to us who do uh, appreciate and do understand, do understand Jewish roots. So it's just as a way of introduction, let me say uh, one, one or two things. First, and this is a very common critique that I hear among, from my Jewish friends. Jesus was a nice Jewish rabbi, but Paul turned him into a god and created Christianity. Okay? I'd like to um, quote to you, uh, or paraphrase, David Flusser. David Flusser was a professor at the Hebrew University. He was probably... Israel's greatest authority on uh, Jesus and Christianity. And he wrote in his book, uh, a book called Jesus, he wrote very simply, he says, if you think that Paul took a dead rabbi and turned him into a god, he said, you better think again. He says, because the roots of Christology Yes, the roots of this, of, of this high view of who Jesus is actually comes from Jesus himself. It's not something that Paul invents. In fact, in our passage today, may I remind you that before Jesus gives this so-called great commission, he reminds people once again of who he is. He tells them all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And I think most of us know that uh, Jesus is simply quoting from Daniel chapter seven. 
And in Daniel 7, we read about this son of man. And this son of man says, uh, this passage in Daniel talks about a vision in which uh, the, the prophet sees God, but then he sees this other figure. Uh, and this other figure is described uh, as follows. It says, then I continued, it says, in my vision at night, Daniel 7:13. I looked and there was before me one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. And yes, all nations and people of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, Professor Flusser, along with many others, reminded us that when Jesus called himself or referred, himself, referred to himself as the son of man, he was referring to this passage in Daniel. It was his way of hinting, yes, and uh, telling people, I'm not sticking out my chest and you know, pointing to myself, but in a very Jewish way, I'm telling you that I am this son of man figure. And you may notice that uh, in the, the passage in Daniel, it talks about all men, or it talks about, sorry, about all nations worshiping him. And our passage today, the context was before Jesus gives this so-called great commission, the context was what? Worship. They worshiped him. By the way, even if some of them doubted, I love the fact that even though some doubted, Jesus still commissioned and sent them out in any event. That doubting, yes, um, is not necessarily, uh, does not necessarily or should mean exclusion from a community. Doubting in order to undermine the faith of others those should be excluded. But having honest doubts, those who have such things should, be, should certainly uh, continue to be a part of our community. So the, the 11 on the mountain worship Jesus. And of course, four other places in Matthew's gospel, if I'm not mistaken, they also worship the Magi, the apostles. So here uh, we have the, these Jewish monotheist worshiping Jesus. That's the context. That is certainly the context. And the thing I, we hear next or hear so often, well, you know, the demon, in, the demon in this story or the devil in this story is Constantine. Everything bad happens from Constantine onwards. But my dear friends, whether it's the, the scriptural witness of the New Testament or certainly the early church long before Constantine. Yes, we as a community understood that Jesus himself was a divine figure. That if someone was gonna forgive our sins, be present with us forever, be um, sitting at the right hand of the Father and answering our prayer, that that person could not be simply a human being or a glorified human being, that that person had to be God himself. And many people still insist, yes, Constantine uh, somehow was a pagan, uh, and took pagan ideas or Greek philosophical ideas, and he brought them into the, uh, in the Christian community, and, and we came up with Jesus, uh, as, a, as the second member of the Trinity. But how does it make sense that Christians who died, who hated paganism, who hated idolatry, who went to the arena and were killed by wild animals or beheaded for their faith, why are they being beheaded and dying for a, a pagan idea or dying, by, or dying for some kind of uh, uh, idolatry of the so again, I think here's the rule of thumb. 
I hope this is a rule of thumb that all of us who appreciate our Jewish roots, all of us who appreciate the Jewish context of the gospel, I hope that uh, we can live by the following, that um, if we don't understand Jesus in his Jewish context, it's a tragedy and we're making a big mistake. But we're making even a bigger mistake if we understand Jesus only to be a Jewish rabbi of the first century who somehow had some mistaken followers. And what is important about the so-called Trinity, if you, don't, if you want, don't want to use that word, which is not a biblical word, then I'm, uh, I certainly understand that and have some sympathy. What's important is that it reveals to us, it reveals to us perhaps the fullest uh, understanding or the, f- the fullest revelation of actually who God is. And the God that it reveals, the, it, that's being revealed to us is not the Christian God or not three gods, but it's the God of Israel. It's the God of the Bible. And so when we think in terms of this so-called triunity, we shouldn't divorce this, yes, from the God who reveals himself in scripture, starting in Genesis and going to Moses and to David and to Jeremiah. It's the same God. And yet, if we understand this, if we understand the Godhead as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we understand things about God, we understand his nature in a fuller way that hopefully enriches our lives and gives us an identity, a fuller identity in God. Because what's important about identity is that identity shapes behavior. When we have the right identity, we've, when we've absorbed that identity, it will then shape our practice. But the problem with the Trinity, often that, at least for us, is that this is just some abstract idea. It's just some theology that sometimes we fight over it and most of the time we ignore it because we can't understand it. But I'd like to point out to you that in this um, passage that we had in Matthew, that the, the mention of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit isn't given in some theological context. It's given in a practice, in a practice of and and by the way, this is not a dirty word, and a ritualistic practice is God himself is the author of ritual. God hates dead ritual without content. But if you read the book of Leviticus, uh, for example, ritual is very important. And here we have baptism, initiation into the community. So the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is indeed... Uh, It is a practice. It is something that can be lived out. It is something you might say is doable. It's not just some strange, perhaps to some of us, confusing idea that uh, we're embarrassed about, especially some of us who live in Jerusalem. We sometimes try to downplay or to sidestep these issues with our Jewish and Muslim friends. But as I said to you before, we shouldn't because what's involved here is something so incredibly beautiful and something so important that to either to deny it or to minimize it means that we're impoverished. Because what is, it, what is the Godhead and the relationship in the Godhead? What does it tell us? It tells us, by the way, first maybe it tells us a lot, but the couple of things that come to my mind. God is not static. God is not, um, God hasn't wound up a clock and gone away. And I think this is essential because many Christians and maybe many uh, uh, secular people uh, as well, many Christians now understand God as some kind of therapeutic deist or they have a therapeutic deism is a better way of saying it. Meaning God's out there somewhere, but he's not really involved too much with me. Uh, But when he does get involved, he's gonna help me financially or emotionally 
or psychologically, physically, whatever that may be. Yes? Secondly, yet God is not self-absorbed. So both of these are good lessons for uh, the world in which we live. We ourselves, uh, many of us in, the, in Western culture, are obsessed with ourselves and obsessed with our problems and obsessed with our issues and obsessed with our feelings. But if we understand that God is living in a community, yes, that God is relating to, um, that God himself relates to the Son and the Son relates to the Spirit, that this community, within this community is love and service, that the Father honors the Son and the Son honors the Father, yes. That there's no, uh, you might say, self-obsession here, g going on here. We also learn that God is invitational. Yes, that God, that this, this community of Father, Son, and Spirit is constantly inviting, yes, us into that relationship. That's why I like the famous Russian icon that's behind me. There are many things we could say about the icon. In fact, in years past, we've, we've talked about it in greater detail. But uh, one of the, the things that this, I think speaks to me the loudest is in this 16th century, I believe, or um, maybe it's earlier in this icon, you have three, these are the three uh, angels that visit Abraham at Mamre, uh, but it also becomes a, uh, a Christian understanding or it's the way that we prefigure the Trinity. But here they are sitting at table, and they're sitting in such a way, yes, that they're inviting us in, yes, to come and share with them. <clears throat> We're inviting us in to come, uh, to come and share with them. And so I think th this is, begins, becomes what's in, uh, this becomes essential or important for us because it tells us, and here we can put on a, see these things through a Jewish lens, it tells us what God does. Not who, just who is God, yes, but what does God do? And it's by what God does that we actually, uh, that we actually can know him. Now, what does this have to do with the Matthew text that we just read? Simple text on which m millions of good sermons have been preached, millions of uh, people have been inspired uh, by this text. I don't know if you've ever thought of it, but if we can actually live the Trinity or live a Trinitarian life, or you have to put it in modern English, do the Trinity, and it's not just some foreign theological idea, again, that uh, confuses us and doesn't uh, uh, act as a mystery, then what do we learn from this passage? Passage is that in actual fact, yes, discipleship, as understood from the pages of Scripture and the New Testament, the life of Jesus, the book of Acts, discipleship is actually a way of living the life of the Trinity. Because discipleship, which is a Jewish practice from the Second Temple period, which is something that ironically Jews took in part from the Hebrew Bible, the, the example of Elijah and Elisha, but also they had some influence from the Greek, uh, the practices of Greek philosophical schools. Discipleship, yes, is being mentored and taught Yes, you're being mentored and taught, and discipleship is always rel relational. We sometimes think of discipleship as a program, but discipleship is not a program. It's a relationship. It's being in relationship with Jesus. And ancient Jewish discipleship, yes, ancient Jewish discipleship worked on several principles. And these principles, again, are something I think that we see in the Trinity itself. So first of all, uh, there was uh, a desire 
uh, an individual, had a desire to learn God's word, had a desire to learn the Torah. Now the goal of discipleship is not the Torah, but at the same time, you can't learn God's word simply by sitting in a classroom. And you can't learn God's word by uh, hearing lectures or hearing MP3 files. You have to watch somebody live it out. Somebody who's mature, somebody who's been transformed, somebody who's seasoned, you might say, in the Holy Spirit. You have to watch how they treat their wives, how they, do they give to charity, what are their relationships like with others around them. It's one thing to be pious in a, in a pulpit or pious at the theological seminary. It's another thing if you're living it out at home. And so consequently, in, in the day and age in which Jesus lived, many young men and apparently women wanted to see the Torah lived out. Now the goal of this discipleship in relationship wasn't just to do the rules. Yes, the goal of the discipleship was actually holiness because it's through obedience to the scripture that we become holy and holiness brings us into blessing and holiness brings us into a deeper, more intimate knowledge of God. That's the goal. The goal isn't just to absorb. And for this to work, for this to work, discipleship to work, there had to be a relationship of love between the teacher and the student because the student had to consider the teacher, the rabbi, to be uh, more important or closer than their father and their mother. And the, te- and the student also had to serve. The student had to serve. And so when we have real, true, biblical discipleship, again, it's more than a program. A program can help. It's more than study, memorizing scripture. Memorizing scripture can be helpful. Having a prayer time is very helpful. But ultimately, it has to be relational. Yes, it has to be relational. At the end of the day, preaching from the front of the congregation doesn't change people that much. People change in relationships. Yes, people change in relationships. This makes discipleship hard. It makes it time consuming. Oh, it'd be so much easier to preach, expect everyone to change and you know, go on to the next service. service. Yes, but the, the disciple, there's love. Yes, there's service. Because a disciple has to serve the teacher. This is the Trinity. So again, it's relational between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, there's love. They serve one another and in a very practical way. New Testament discipleship is modeled. It's modeled on the life of the Trinity. And that's what makes it relevant for us. That's actually what makes it important. That we're not just disciples of Jesus. Yes, we're being brought into the community of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we learn to imitate their life, as we're transformed into their image, remember our reading from Genesis, let us make human beings in our image. Yes, let us make human beings in our image, which means let us make them relational. Let them not be self-absorbed. Let them not, uh, you know, be somehow um, static. Yes, and by the way, just as God invites, just as God uh, commissioned Abraham to bring blessing to the nations, yes, so too the church is fulfilling and expanding that call of Abraham to bring bl- a blessing to the nations and the knowledge of the Lord. How? Preaching is important. Sermons are important, church services are important, but ultimately it's in relationships, yes, that um, we change 
that we're transformed. And again, the goal isn't just to obey a bunch of commandments, to be good, not to commit immorality, not to lie, not to cheat, not to steal. God's goal from the beginning, from the book of Genesis, was to bring blessing to the human family and to enter into relationship with them. That's what discipleship does, yes? The God, that, that triunity, that triune God, or the, the, the Godhead, wants to bring blessing and wants us to come into intimate relationship. What? You mean little, little old discipleship is supposed to accomplish those big, huge goals? And the answer is yes. Because God's very practical. It's not, again, it's not an abstract idea, but it's something that we can do, and it's something that we can live, and yes, and it becomes the basis of the Great Commission. Now, the Great Commission is hard sometimes. Again, it's easier to preach, set up a tent, preach to 5,000, and leave. It's much harder to stick around and train and teach and mentor very difficult, kind of up and down, back and forth, back and forth. But at the, in the end, yes, the fruit, the results are much deeper, more significant and longer lasting. And of course, we all know that in the culture in which we live, maybe I'll speak for the United States, we have a lot of believers Lots and lots of believers. But the question is, do we have mature holy people? Yes. And again, holiness isn't a goal in and of itself. Maturity isn't the goal in and of itself. The goal is God. The goal is God. The goal is to connect or to uh, come into relationship with a God who is relational, Again, a God who's not self-absorbed, a God who's invitational, because when we come into relationship with us, he sends us out. A God um, who, is, uh, who creates because he loved. And so this is our challenge. And thankfully our challenge is we are helped by the fact that Jesus said, I am with you always until the end of the age. Now that promise is not only a general promise that the Lord is with us when we wash our clothes and the Lord is with us when we you know, go to the, uh, the grocery store, but it's a promise that is given especially when we take the risk and go, and in our going we make disciples, that he is there in our midst to empower us, to back us up, to help us uh, overcome our weaknesses for the mentor and for the student to enable us, yes, to learn, to change, to put the teachings of Jesus especially into practice and again come to that place where God, yes, where God intended for us from the beginning. Yes, it's, Genesis is connecting with uh, Matthew 28. Yes, the small always reaches the big. The particular goes universal. The God of Israel is the God of the whole world. Yes, the Messiah of Israel is the, mess, the Lord and Savior of the entire world. Yes, the new covenant that's given to the house of Judah and the house of Israel, yes, it becomes the New Testament and salvation for all of uh, the human family. Discipleship in your church on a Wednesday night, yes, as small as insignificant as it might seem, these are, this, is how, this is how God works. Yes, and again, his goal is to bring blessing, yes, to each one of us, to the human family, because it is uh, by obeying him, 
we bring blessings to ourselves and to others and to come into that intimate knowledge of him. Father in heaven, we thank you that uh, you have indeed saved us, that you have purchased us with a price. But Lord, we want more. We want to fully know your blessings. We want to fully know you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We want to have that divine life that you have with each member, yes, of the Godhead. We pray that you will bring us in, that uh, you will in give us that grace, Lord, to be disciples of your Son, to obey his teaching, to allow that teaching to change us and to transform us and to go and to make others disciples as you, are, as you yourself are making us. Father, we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus for his sake and for the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.